Latin 2, I have big news. Today is a big day because it's time to learn passive verbs. Passive verbs. No, this is not a new verb tense. We already know all the verb tenses. Now we're going to learn the other voice because before today, all the verbs we've learned have all been active voice verbs. No matter what person they were, number they were, tense they were, they were all active. Even what mood, right? We talk sometimes about indicative versus imperative verbs, still active. They have been anyway. But now, starting in chapter 30 of our textbook, we're going to start having passive verbs, verbs that are not active. And if you don't know what I mean by that, well, that's that's what this video is for. <laughs> this video is here to explain what it means for a verb to be passive. So let's uh, start with just what it means for a verb to be passive before we actually get into what they look like or anything. What it means is that you still have a subject, but that subject is not doing the verb. It may seem weird because, you know, a lot of us have it ingrained into us from a very young age in you know, elementary school that the subject does the verb. But the verb is in action and the subject does it. Well, that's true as long as the verb is active. But sometimes the verb is not active. Sometimes the verb is passive. Uh, in fact, a lot of your English teachers have probably tried to um, scare you away from ever using the passive. And I have mixed feelings about, you know, how frightened one should be of the passive voice. Um, but what really gets me is when English teachers tell you not to use the passive and then don't explain what it is, uh, which some of them do that. Now, some of them do explain what it is, which is awesome. Good job, y'all. But so what is going on in a passive sentence is that the subject is not doing the verb. The subject is being acted upon by some other force, by some other agent or some other cause, so that the verb is happening to the subject instead of the other way around. All right? I'll show you an example in English real quick. All right? You notice I've got my color coding, all right? Active in blue, passive in red. So the sentence on top says, I love my cats, all right? It's a real simple sentence, and it is active. I am the subject. I am doing a thing. I am loving, and I am loving a direct object. My cats, that's who I'm loving. Now, if you look at the sentence below that, I'm expressing the same sentiment, but even though I'm talking about the same scenario, I'm no longer the subject of it. I have flipped it around so that my cats are the subject, and instead of talking about them doing something, I'm talking about something happening to them. My cats are loved, all right? The subject in my cats are loved is my cats, but they're not doing anything. It's passive because something is happening to them, all right? So let that sink in, because here's the thing. The, the verb is still very much governed by the subject in terms of, like, person and number. Our loved is still third person and plural because I have a third person plural subject, my cats, right? But they're not doing anything. It's happening to them, okay? So that's what it means for a verb to be passive. It means that it, the action is being reflected back onto the subject. In fact, if you're ever wondering if a verb is active or passive, or, or if a verb could be passive, um, flip it around backwards, right? Like in this sentence, it's active. When I flip it around backwards, what was the direct object became the subject, right? Uh, or if I had a passive sentence, if I were to flip it around and make it active, the subject would become a direct object, all right? And for that matter, some verbs can't be passive. Some verbs only make sense in the active um, because they don't take direct objects. If a verb doesn't take a direct object, if it can't take a direct object, then it can't be passive. Simple as that, right? Um, and something else you'll notice about the passive, it doesn't tell you who did the thing, right? In the active sentence, we know who did the thing. I did it. I love my cats. But in the passive one, it just says my cats are loved. It does not tell you that my cats are loved by me or by somebody else or by no one. It, it just says my cats are loved. It doesn't tell you who did the loving because the subject didn't do the thing. For this exact reason, the passive is very famously used in the classic example, mistakes were made. 
Um, that's that's what you do when you want to admit to the mistake, but not throw anybody under the bus for actually making it. So that's conceptually what's going on, all right? Now, despite the concept, I, I do also need to show you the forms, which is to say we're already five minutes in. This video is going to go for a little bit. All right, now, any verb tense can be made passive. However, okay, I'm not going to show you all the passive forms today for a couple of reasons. One, because I'm just not going to show you all the forms, you're going to need to look those up. I'll, I'll post some resources for you to do so, or you can use your books. Um, but also, part of this is because we're not going to do the whole system, or we're not going to do all the systems, rather. Um, we're going to work on just the present system at first, that is to say present, imperfect, and future tense. Um, and we'll worry about the perfect system passives uh, later. Not much later, but later, because they, they look different. They don't look like the present system ones. For the present system ones, the way you make it passive is you take the present stem, and then you add passive endings. Now, we're still talking about personal endings, but different personal endings than we used when we were learning our active verbs, where you had O or M, and then S, T, MUS, TIS, and UNT, now you're going to have ar, ris, ter, mer, many, untor. All right? Ar, ris, ter, mer, many, untor. They do the same things, which is to say this is for the first person singular. So if my passive verb has a subjective I, this is the ending you're going to put on it. If my passive verb has a subjective U, then this is the ending you're going to put on it. And of course, the, the main feature here is the letter R, because they all have the letter R. Except... Except MINI. I, I don't know why MINI doesn't have the letter R. I would love it to be more consistent, but for some reason the second person plural when the subject is you all does not have an R in the ending. I, I don't know what to tell you. But all you do to make a verb passive is you apply these endings to the same present stem that you would have used if your verb was active. All right. So as an example, if I stick with you know love for the moment, um, where... Um, I would have had amo, amas, amat, amamos, amatis, amat. You can see I've got the same things here. I've just replaced all those active endings with the passive ones. But I'm still working off the present stem, which is ama, ama. All right? Now, you do need to keep the o in the first person, so don't, don't ditch that. You have amor, and then I have ama for all my other in the present stem, and then just those passive endings that I pointed out a moment ago. Amor, amar, amator, amamor, amamini, amantor. All right? So, I am loved. You are loved. He, she, it is loved. We are loved. You all are loved. They are loved. All right? That's the form that was, uh, would have been in the example I gave a moment ago. All right? So, that's what's going on. And, and of course, you'll notice that when I say these in translation, I always have some form of the verb to be in there. Right? It's not I love. It's I am loved. You are loved. In English, that's the way we make our verbs passive, is we incorporate the verb to be in there somewhere as a helping verb, okay? Of course, which version of, you, of it you use is going to depend on person and number. I am, you are, he is, etc., okay? This goes for all of our present system. It's the same with the imperfect. The imperfect is present stem plus BA plus the ending. Well, that's true if the ending is active or passive. So... Where I have amabam, um, amabas, um, amabat, I have amabar, um, amabaris, um, amabator. All right? If you need to, like, sit and stare at these for a minute, go ahead and pause this video. But, like I said, it's kind of a long one. i got to keep moving down the board, okay? Same deal if it's future. For the first and second conjugation, the future is the present stem plus bi. So where I had amabo, um, amabis, um, amabit, um, I now have amabor, um, amabaris, um, amabitor. Okay? Again, if you need to stop and stare at these forms for a minute, pause the video. But otherwise, I'm just going to point out that this is literally the same as the future, just with the active ending swapped for passive, with one exception. One exception. And it's this letter right here. right? In the active, we would have had B-O, B-I, 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 B-U. Which is to say they're all the same, except this one where in the second person, for some reason, we have switched out an I for an E. Now, that's annoying, right? Because all the rest of them were literally the same, but with passive ending. That one is different. Now, these same rules are what you would apply for the second conjugation. And I'm not going to show you the second conjugation right now, again, for time. These are things you can look up on the internet or in your books, okay? 
Um, I am going to go ahead and very quickly show you a third conjugation, though, um, because it is a little bit different, not than, than it normally is, but it's a little bit different from first and seconds. And then again, I'm going to skip the third IO and fourth. You're just going to need to go ahead and look those ones up, okay? But the same rules apply. It's what it looks like in the active, but with a new set of endings. So where I had agoa gesagit, I'll have agora gerasagitor. Again, there is a discrepancy here. The, e, the I changes to an E in the second person, but only in the second person. Everything else is the same. Where I would have had agam, agas, agat, I have aga, sorry, agabam, agebas, agebat. I have agebar, agebaris, agebator. All right? No difference except that my active ending is switched for a passive. And again, the same in the future. Third IOs and fourths uh, don't use bo bispit in the future. They use am as et, sorry, am es et. Well, I'm just going to switch out those active endings for passive, just like I've done everywhere else. So where I had agam, ages, aget, I'll have agar, ageris, agetur. I did underline this E here. It's actually not different from the active. The active definitely would have had an E here. But I did want to point out how um, you do have to be careful because you end up with a future and a present in the second person that look eerily similar, all right? That can be unpleasant, and I'm sorry that it's unpleasant, but, you know, it's just how it's going to be, all right? Now, I know uh, I'm skipping the, the second and the third IO and the fourth, but those are forms you can look up on your own as long as you know the principle here, which is present stem, plus a modifier if you need one, if it's not present, if it's imperfect or future, plus those passive endings, arvistur, more mini, untor, all right? So if you need to see the other forms, if you need some individual verb practice, hit me up in a comment. Um, you can also use one, uh, one of those practice sites that we posted in Google Classroom. If you're watching this at some point in the future and you don't know what I'm talking about, well, I don't know, do some Googling. Or if you actually know me and it's the future, well, just message me and I'll send you what I'm referring to that everybody else already knows about. The thing I haven't done yet is shown you text examples. And we should do that. You know, rather than just see the forms and hear the concept, let's look at some actual sentences. Now, as you can see, I, I've pretty much used up all my board space. I only had a tiny bit at the end. It wasn't enough to fit all the examples in, so I'm going to have to start moving around the room and using other bits of furniture. All right, so let's try this one. There we go. I've got to make sure I don't erase it with my head. So um, on all of these, I've given you the same sentence twice, but once active and once passive. So what it says up at the top is what we had on the board over there in English. I love my cats. Amo, I love. That's an active verb, first person subject. Meos feles, direct object. If I make it passive, Meos feles becomes me feles. It becomes nominative. It's now the subject of my passive sentence, my cats are loved. And you can see I switched out amo, which was active, for amantur, which is passive. Simple as that. All right? Same verb, same stem. I'm just putting a passive ending instead of an active one. It's really not that big of a deal. All right? But let's see some more examples just in case, right? I mean, we do have other tenses, and, you know, you want plenty to go on. You know, I really should get just like a second board that would be helpful. So there you go. Now I'm talking about just one of my cats, Leia, because I have two, Leia and Luke. Leia um, was biting my feet. Or sorry, my foot. I have it singular in this one. Right? Leia was biting my foot. She used to do it all the time. Thankfully, they have actually mostly stopped. But it still makes a good example. If I want to make that passive, then I'm going to take the object, which was my foot, Make it my subject, meus pes. Meus pes more de bator. My foot was being bit. But, you know, I mentioned a moment ago that one of the problems of the passive is you don't know who did the thing, right? If I just say my foot was being bitten and you don't know that it was Leia doing it, unless I add an agent to my sentence. That's the thing about the passive that... Um, could be a problem if you are worried about it, but there is a remedy to this problem. If you want to have a passive sentence and you still want to know who did the thing, you can do it by adding an ablative of agent. Yes, now this is a verb on... Sorry, this is a video on verbs and ablatives. Ugh. But I promise they're intimately connected. See, the ablative of agent is when you have... 
uh, a or ab plus an ablative, which makes sense. We already know that a or ab is a preposition that takes the ablative. But instead of translating it as away from, you're going to translate it as by, all right? And you might be thinking, oh, wait, 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 how am I going to know in a sentence whether to translate it as away from or by? And the answer is context clues. If it means away from, then it's probably going to have some kind of a verb of motion in there. And most likely, the thing you're going away from is going to be an, an object, right, or a place. Whereas if the a or ab is in front of a person or some other living creature, and if your verb is passive, well, then it's probably an agent. It's probably telling you who did the thing that is being done by the passive verb. So that same sentence that we had over there on that other desk now is here, but, but with an ablative of agent. My foot, meus pace, was being bitten a lea, by lea. And I can have my passive sentence, I can still know who did the biting by using my ablative of agent, and I've got my, my prepositional phrase there that tells you that. I'll see one more example, and then, uh, and then I'll send you guys off. I know this video is longer than most, but you know, some of these topics are more complicated than others. So. Last one, I wanted to make sure and get a future example in here as well. So what you see up there at the top is a question. Is Luke, or will Luke rather, make noise all night long? It's, it's an honest question. Cats do this sometimes. My cats actually are pretty good about not doing that most of the time, but they're cats. Sometimes they get in a mood, right? Well, if I want to say that in the passive, then I would take the noise, sonatum, which was the object when it was active, Flip it around, make that noise the subject. So sonatum becomes sonatus. Will noise be made all night long a Luca by Luke? And let's hope not because I have not been sleeping well lately and the cats making noise all night long ain't gonna help. All right, guys, I know it's a massively long one and you've still got other forms to look up, but this is ever so important. I mean, this is essentially as if we're adding a whole dimension to our verbs um, because... Like I said, this is not another tense or something. This is something that applies to all the tenses and persons and numbers that we already know. Uh, it's big. It's big. And we're going to get a lot of practice on it in chapter 30, chapter 31, 32. All of these chapters are about the passive. So we're going to be deep diving on this one for a minute. But of course, as always, ask questions if you have them. And I will see you ever so soon. Bye-bye.